Welcome to the Boonesboro Bible Church Gatekeeper Sunday School class, which is loosely I stream to you from Boonesboro at the Boonesboro Bible Church. My name is Ernie Best. Today is October the 30th, the year of our Lord 2022. This morning I am streaming to you from home due to a problem I'm having with uh, hernia. I'm going to have surgery in about two weeks, and the pain level can get pretty high sometimes. So. I'm coming to you from home. Before we do anything else, let's open in a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with excitement in our hearts, Father. Lord, I pray for those who are watching who may have never made a commitment, never have repented of their sin and turned from it and place their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, I pray that today would be that day. Lord, and I pray over the reading of your word this morning, your word that is so perfect and true. Again, Father, I thank you and and pray for all those on, in our sick uh, room, the prayer room, Lord, for healing. Lord, for understanding as we we study your word, for open our understanding and discernment to help us to know exactly what it says, help us to know exactly what it means and how it applies to each one of our lives. And Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit will draw those who have never made that commitment this morning to you, Lord, that they will make a decision for Christ. Because, Lord, we, they are all, and we are all in dire need of a Savior. And Father, I thank you and glorify you, and I pray all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen and amen. The book of Proverbs. We're in section 3. The Proverbs of Solomon on practical and moral grounds. This began back in chapter 10, verse 1. It runs through the to the end of chapter 22. Proverbs 17 has 28 verses. And the theme of chapter 17 is concepts such as honesty, controlled speech, and family harmony. We begin with section A in your outline. The first six verses is talking about family harmony and honesty. And then from verses 21, we'll look at how sin, sin caused by anger or division takes place. And then from verses 22 to 28, Godly spirituality and a controlled tongue. Chapter 10 uh, began a very lengthy series of Solomon's statements concerning wisdom. This chapter continues that continues by noting such concept as honesty, controlled speech, and family harmony. The list continues into chapter 22. Let's begin. Section A in your outline, Family, Harmony, and Honesty. The first six verses. Beginning with verse 1, it says, Better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. So, a dry piece of toast eaten in a relaxed setting is better than an extravagant meal in an elegant house full of feasting where there is bickering and unhappiness. Verse 2. A wise servant will rule over a son who calls a shame and will share an inheritance among the brothers. A capable servant often raises higher than a son who causes shame. So Solomon's servant 
Jeroboam gained control over ten of the tribes of Israel, leaving Solomon's son Rehoboam with only two. And I thought we'd pause for a moment this morning and examine these two kings, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Now, Jeroboam was from the tribe of Ephraim, a servant of King Solomon and the son of a widow. He later became the first king of the divided northern kingdom of Israel. He is first mentioned in 1 Kings 11.26, where it says, Jeroboam, the son of Nebate, an Ephraimite of Zeruiah, a servant of Solomon, whose mother's name was Zeruiah, Zeruiah a widow also lifted up his hand against the king. Jeroboam was a very skilled worker. When Solomon saw how well the young man did his work, he placed Jeroboam over the labor force of the tribes of Joseph. 1 Kings 11.28 So one day, the prophet Ahijah approached Jeroboam with a prophecy. The prophet tore a new cloak into twelve pieces, and he said in 1 Kings 11.31, Take ten pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give it to you ten tribes. 1 Kings 11.31 you see, the idol worship of the Israelites caused God to devise, divide the kingdom. Verse 33. The house of David would remain a remnant of the kingdom, including Jerusalem, because of God's covenant with David. Verse 32. 1 Kings 11.40 says Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled to Egypt and stayed there until Solomon's death. Following Solomon's death, Solomon's son Jeroboam became king and foolishly threatened to make life more difficult for the people of the land. 1 Kings 12.14 Now this led to rebellion against Rehoboam and the ten northern tribes crowned Jeroboam their king, First Kings 20, 12, 20. The division predicted by Ahijah came to pass, First Kings twelve fifteen. Jeroboam had been promised great blessings and a continuing dynasty if he would follow the Lord, First Kings eleven thirty eight. However, Jeroboam did not obey the Lord. Instead, he had two golden calves made for the people to worship in the northern kingdom and made priests and celebrations for those priests. This idolatry is often referred to as the sin of Jeroboam. In the later chapters of First and Second Kings, King Jeroboam was confronted by an unnamed prophet from Judah. 1 King 13, verses 1 through 10. Later, the prophet Ahijah pronounced a severe judgment on Jeroboam and his family because of Jeroboam's blatant rejection of the Lord. In 1 Kings 14, verses 10 and 11, it says, I am going to bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam every last male in Israel, slave or free. <clears throat> I will burn up the house of Jeroboam as one burns dung until it is all gone. Dogs will eat those belongings, those belonging to Jeroboam 
who die in the city, and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. The Lord has spoken. First Kings 14, verses 10 and 11. So in total, Jeroboam reigned over the northern kingdom of Israel for 22 years. And the Bible says he slept with his fathers, and Nadab, his son, reigned in his place. Now, Nadab reigned over Israel for, Israel for two years, continuing his father's adultery. Then uh, Basha plotted against Nadab, assassinated him in Philistine territory, and usurped the throne. 1 Kings 15, 27, and 28. As soon as Bashan began to reign, he killed Jeroboam's entire family. He, he did not leave Jeroboam anyone that breathed, but destroyed them all according to the word of the Lord given through his servant Ahijah. The Shilonite. The dire prophecy against the house of Jeroboam, of course, came true. Though Jeroboam began well, he did not finish well. God raised him up as a king, yet he, as king, he plunged the entire nation into sin. His life offers example of, of the powerful influence a person can have over others in a negative way. His judgment shows the truth of Galatians 6 verse 7 that says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. A little over a century after Jeroboam's death, another king named Jeroboam ruled over Israel. King Jeroboam II came to power in around 793 BC. He also did evil in the eyes of the Lord. 2 Kings 14, 24. However, the Lord granted Jeroboam II military victories against the Syrians and used Jeroboam II to preserve his people. 2 Kings 14, verses 27 and 28. You see, the serpent often shares in the inheritance with the sons on equal basis. In Abram's case, it looked for it looked for a while as if his servant would be the only heir. Genesis fifteen verses two and three. Proverbs seventeen verse three says, "The refining pot is for silver." And the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. God what can do God can do what no with no extremely difficult experience or situation or furnace can do. They can test silver and gold, but the Lord can test the human heart. In the process of testing, he removes the impurities and purifies the life until he sees his own image reflected. Verse 4, an evildoer gives heed to false lips. A liar listens eagerly to a spiteful tongue. An evildoer listens to people with lying lips. They welcome lies unfounded rumors and false accusation. Liars, in turn, like to listen to scandal and slander and a, and a spiteful tongue. In that sense, the kind of talk a man feeds is a barometer of what is in his heart. Verse 5, he who mocks the poor reproaches his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. Now we've already seen in Proverbs 14.31 that however, that whoever makes fun of the poor 
insults his maker. You can also see that in James 5, verses 1 through 4. Whoever takes a heartless satisfaction in calamity, which almost inevitably makes people poor, will not go unpunished by the Lord. The book of Obadiah pronounces doom on Edom for rejoicing when Jerusalem fell. Chapter 17, verse 6 says, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of the children is their father. A large and godly future family brings honor to old men. Look at Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, and Psalm 128, verse 3. And children likewise can be grateful for their father. There is no reason for a generational gap here. Let her be in your outline, verses 7 through 21, talks about sin caused by anger or division. Verse 7 says, excellent speech is not, be is, is not becoming to a fool, much less lying lips to a prince. Noble and excellent speech stems out of out of place in the mouth of an ill-mannered, coarse, and contemptible fool. Even more unsuitable are lying lips to a prince. You expect more from a prince. The world expects more from those of us who are children of God. They have higher standards for us than they do for themselves. Verse 8 says, a present is a precious stone in the eyes of its possessor. Whenever he turns, wherever he turns, he prospers. A bribe serves like a good luck charm, or so its owner thinks. Whenever he uses it, it performs wonders for him, opening doors obtaining favor and privilege, or getting him out of trouble. Verse 9 says, He who covers a transgression seeks loves, but he who re repeats a matter separates friends. The man who refuses to remember an offense against him seeks love and friendship. The one who insists on digging up past grievances only succeeds in alienating friends. When we learn to love, we also learn to cover, to forget and overlook many faults in other people. One woman to another, don't remember the mean things she said about you. The other woman, I only remember, I don't, I not only remember, I distinctly remember forgetting. George Washington Carver was refused admission to a college because he was black. Years later, when someone asked him for the name of the college, he answered, it doesn't matter. Love had conquered. Verse 10, rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. A simple reprimand makes a deep impression on a wise man when a severe beating on a fool. Usually people who are sensitive don't need harsh forms of discipline. But those who are unfeeling and indifferent require what I like to call slap therapy. It's hard for them to think that they would ever do anything wrong. Verse 11, the evil man seeks only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger will be sent against him. You see, an un 
a, a evil man is unwilling to submit to lawful authority. He is determined to have his own way. The cruel messenger who will be sent against the rebel may be an arresting officer sent by the king. Or it may be the messenger of death sent by God. Verse 12 says, Let a man, man meet a bear robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. A bear robbed of her cubs is a, a fierce and un, is unmanageable. But she is not nearly as dangerous as a fool in a fit of temper. Once he gets some crazy idea into his head, nothing will stop him. Nothing will turn him from it. Verse 13. Whoever reve reveals evil for good, evil will not depart from his house. A curse rests on the house of any man who repays a kindness with injury. David repaid his royal general Uriah with treachery and as a result brought misery upon his house. 2 Samuel 12, 9 and 10. Verse 14 says, The beginning of strife is like releasing water. Therefore, stop contention before a quarrel starts. Quarrel starts. When a hole develops in a dike, the water rushes through in and enlarges the hole very rapidly. It's the same with quarrels. Minor disputes have a way of growing to major in major proportions. So it is better to stop while a dispute is still insignificant. Otherwise, you may be plunged into a great war very soon. Verse 15, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike, are an abomination to the Lord. God hate miscarriages of justice. To acquit the guilty or to condemn the innocent is equally abhorrent to him. Our law courts are filled with this today. But men give an account for it for it all when they stand before God. The judicial assertion justice, justice shall follow you echoes down through the corridors of history. Verse 16 Why is there in the hand of the fool the purchase price of wisdom? since he has no heart for it. A person is a fool not to go to great expenses to get an education if he doesn't really mean business, if he's not serious. To be a good learner, one must be highly motivated. He must have a mind to learn. And second and more probable meaning of the proverb is this. A fool should not spend money for wisdom when he doesn't have the ability to grasp things in the first place. But why is this? A price in hand in a, a price in the hand of a fool to buy wisdom when he has no capacity for wisdom. He thinks he can buy wisdom as if it were a loaf of bread. He doesn't realize that he must have under he must have an understanding heart. Verse seventeen: A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversity. A true friend loves in adversity as well as in prosperity. Often it takes hard times to show which friends are genuinely loyal. A quaint note from D.L. Moody's Bible says, A true friend is like the ivy. 
the greater the ruin, the closer the clings. A brother is born for adversity, but that is one of the great privileges of brotherhood, is to be at your side when you really need him most. It is hard to find the Lord Jesus in this verse. It's not hard to find the Lord Jesus in this verse. Verse 18, a man de de devoid of understanding shakes hand in a pledge and becomes surly for his friend. This verse modifies the previous one by showing that love should not be without discernment. It would be a case of bad judgment to agree to guarantee a friend's debt in the event that he should default. Any man who needs a cosigner is a bad credit risk. Why? Why cosign for a bad credit risk? Verse 19, he who loves transgression loves strife, and he who exalts his gate seeks destruction. A man who loves transgression loves strife and vice versa. The man who exalts his gate is one who is, number one, talks arrogantly. Secondly, loudly proclaims his wealth, tells everyone how rich he is. And thirdly, he lives luxuriously and perhaps beyond his means, beyond his means. This man courts destruction. Verse 20, he who has a deceitful heart finds no good, and he who has a perverse tongue falls into evil. A deceitful heart never wins, and a wicked or deprived tongue never prospers. They invite injury or harm and permit, prevent happiness. Verse 21, he who begats a scoffer does, does so in his sorrow, and the father of a fool has no joy. The parent of a senseless mocker lives with sorrow. There is no joy in being the father of this kind of person. Let her see in your outline godly spirituality and a controlled tongue from verses 22 to 28. Verse 22 says, A merry heart does good, like medicine, but a broken spirit drives the bones. Here again we learn that a person's mental outlook has a lot to do with recovery from sickness or accident. A cheerful disposition is a very powerful aid to healing. A broken, cheerless, gloomy spirit saps a person's vitality. You know, up-to-date therapy is unsurpassed. Today's doctor tell us that a healthy laugh is a, a great exercise. When you emit an explosive laugh, they say your diaphragm descends deep into your body and your lungs expand greatly, increasing the amounts of oxygen taken into those lungs. At the same time, it expands sideways. The diaphragm gives your heart a gentle rhythmic massage. The noble organ responds by beating faster and harder, circulating speeds up. Liver, stomach, pancreas, spleen, and gallbladder are all stimulated. Your entire system gets an invigorating lift. All of which confirms what the, the sage old Greek Aristotle said about laughter more than 2,000 years ago. It is a bodily exercise precious to health. But not all laughter is healthful. Howard Paulus, a 
uh, physiologist professor at the University of Tennessee reports that when laughter and smelling are used in a aggressive way to sneer at or to ridicule or embarrass, they are not healthy at all and can really do more harm than, than the laughter than one who is laughed at. A broken spirit dries the bones, we read in, in that verse. Emotions can make you sick, make you ill. They can make hair fall out by the handfuls. Bring on splitting headaches. Clog nasal passages. Make eyes and nose water with asthma and allergies. Tighten the throat with laryngitis. Make skin break out in a rash, even cause teeth to dry, drop out. Emotion can plague one's insides with ulcers and give wives miscarriages, make husbands impotent, and much more. Emotions can kill. Verse 23, a wicked man accepts the bribe behind the back to prevent the ways of justice. A wicked man accepts a bribe because the behind the back to influence the decision of a judge in his favor. Verse 24, wisdom is in the sight of him who has understanding, but the eyes of the fool are on the ends of the earth. A man of understanding sets wisdom as the goal before his eyes and he goes right toward it. A fool has no definite ambition. Rather than search for wisdom, which requires discipline, his eyes wander in fancy all over the world. Verse 25, a foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. One of the great sorrows of parenthood is to have a child who causes nothing but grief and bitterness. Verse 26, also to punish the righteous is not good, nor to strike a prince for their uprightness. Also to punish the righteous is not good, or to strike a prince for their uprightness. Yet this provision of justice takes place each and every day. Verse 27, he who acknowledges, spares his words, and a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. He who has knowledge spares his words, and a man who understands is of a calm spirit. The other, In other words, rash speech, quick temper, portray a shallow character. Verse 28, even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. You see, you can't tell a fool by his facial appearance. He might look ever so wise and intelligent. With closed lips, he may seem even sensible at times. It's better to keep your mouth shut and let people wonder if you're a fool than to open it up and remove all doubt. This proverb has humor in it. It says that it pays to keep your mouth shut. There's a story about an Arkansas farmer who had a son who was simple. He wasn't the brightest bulb in the pack. Folks would say he was not all there. They drove into town with a load of apples, and the father left the son to sit and hold the reins of the horses while he went off to do an errand. Now, son, the father said, don't you say 
anything to anybody. Because if you do, they'll find out you're a fool. The boy promised he wouldn't open his mouth. A father came, a, a man came up to the wagon and asked, How much are your apples, son? The boy never said a word. The man asked two or three times, but the boy just sat there and looked at him. Finally, the man said, What in the world is wrong? You act like a fool. Then he walked away. When the father returned, he asked the boy, how did things go? And the boy answered, well, I kept my mouth shut, Dad, but they found out I was a fool anyway. Now, what can we take away from chapter 17 in the book of Proverbs? What can we learn from Solomon's great wisdom? Well, this chapter continued an extended list of wise sayings from Solomon that began back in Proverbs 10, verse 1. And the first six verses of Proverbs 17, the first section of this chapter, Solomon dealt with virtues such as family harmony and honesty. As do other portions of this book, these statements warn what those who plan evil will suffer consequences. God cannot be deceived, and he knows precisely what's on a person's heart. Now from verses 7 to 21, this next group of Proverbs, Solomon covered a wide range of ideas. Major themes include sins that cause anger or division between people, friendship and careful use of one's resources. The verses often exhibit the common pattern of contrast and double-sided ideas. And the final six verses. Solomon ended this chapter with wisdom centered on godly spirituality and a controlled tongue. In contrast, negativity and bribery are sins to be denounced. Now, what does it mean when the Bible says today is the day of salvation? You see, God has told a sinful world in no certain terms to repent. Mark 6, 12, Luke 24, 47, Acts 3, 19, and Acts 17, 30. To repent means to change your mind from embracing of sin and rejecting of Christ to rejecting of sin and embracing, embracing of Christ. Those who refuse to repent and turn to Christ in faith will suffer eternal consequences. Given that the fact of hell, mankind in his sin is in a dire situation. Why would anyone delay repentance? Time is growing short, dangerously short. Yet many do, even while admitting their sin, and claiming to see their need for salvation. There are several reasons, I think, not to delay repentance. First of all, the, the Bible's command to repent is accompanied by an urgent appeal to do it now. Paul quotes Isaiah 49, 8, which speaks of the day of salvation. Then he says, not to delay. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6.2. Repentance should be taking place as soon as the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins. Look at John 16.8. In other words, today is the day of salvation. The only guarantee you have of salvation is right this second, today. If only you would hear his voice. 
don't harden your hearts. Psalm 95, 7 and 8. Another problem with the vain, delaying repentance is that no one knows the day he will die. And after death comes the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. The rich fool in Jesus' parable in Luke 12, 16 through 20 thought he had plenty of time to enjoy life. But God had news for him. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Verse 20. We have today. We have the present moment. Sunday morning, October the 30th. 2022. And we should use it wisely. Another reason not to delay repentance is that every time we refuse to repent, we continue to sin and our hearts just grow a little bit harder. Look at Hebrews 3, verses 7 and 8. Every time a person says no to what's right, it becomes harder, becomes a little easier to say no the next time too. There is a gradual hardening of the heart, a searing of the conscience, 1 Timothy 4.2 that can numb an unsaving person to the point of being past feeling. This is a dangerous spiritual condition to be in. Also, the harder a person's heart becomes, the more force God will have to apply to bring him to repentance. This is illustrated in the increasingly severe plagues in Egypt. A pharaoh continued to harden the hearts. The place continued to worsen until culminating in the loss of life in every Egyptian household. Exodus chapters 7 through 11. It's hard to kick against the goads. Acts 26, 14. Tragically, there is a point of no return. God may eventually stop trying to bring the chronically rebellious to repentance and give them over to their own ways. Romans 1.28 We never know when this point of no return is. So it's the better part of wisdom is timely repentance. By delaying repentance, we are delaying certain blessings from God. At least three verses bring this to light. Repent then and turn to God, and so your sins may be wiped out. The time of refreshing may come from the Lord. Acts 3.19 He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Proverbs 28.13 Your wrongdoings have kept these showers of blessings away. Your sins have deprived you of good. Jeremiah 5.25 So in delaying repentance, he missed out on God's refreshment. We may not prosper in God's eyes. We may be deprived of God's goodness. It's true that God is gracious to us, and the per person may be able to repent up until the day he dies. But we should not live presumptuously. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. We are not guaranteed three seconds from now. Commentator Charles Eliot put it rightly, for each church and each nation, for each individual soul, there is a golden present which may never reoccur. 2 Corinthians 6.2 James 4.17 says, If anyone then knows the good that, that ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Once we know what is right, 
We are we are responsible to do it. And once we know something is a sin, we are responsible to repent of it and forsake it. We dare not delay repentance. There is a time when the Lord shut the door of the ark. And the flood swept away everything outside the ark. Genesis 7, 16. There came a time when the wedding party began and those who were not ready for the coming of the bridegroom were locked out. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Let's pray. Father, you have given us your word. Father, we have heard this stern warning that today is the day of salvation. And Father, I pray that as your Holy Spirit draws the lost, that their eyes will be opened and they will see how dearly they need a Savior. And Father, I pray today will be that day. I pray, Father, that you will, will open their hearts and their minds. And Father, they will make that decision to repent of their sin and turn from those sins and to, in faith, turn to you as their Lord and Savior. Father, they need your salvation so very dearly. And I thank you, Lord, and I praise you, and I, I glorify your holy name as we pray in, in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen and amen. Well, thank you for tuning in today, and, and, and I just pray that uh, God will touch your heart and just just be open and allow him to lead you and guide you. Read his word and pray that God will show you. Next week, we will move on to Proverbs chapter 18, in which we are still in that Roman numeral three of the Proverbs of Solomon on practical morality. Verse 18 has 24 verses, and the theme of verse 18 is fair-mindedness and seeking out truth from a multitude of sources. The first nine verses talks about discernment in judgment and speech. And in verses 10 through 15, talks about humility and a sincere search for truth. And then verses 16 through 24, perception and relationships. So again, I want to thank you for tuning in. And remember to tune in this morning at 10.30, as Pastor Al Allen brings the morning message. And again, I thank you and, and, and just pray that God will be with you this week. And God will, you will uh, uh, a, a, not resist the, the drawing of the Holy Spirit uh, and receive him as your Savior. And I thank you. and. May God bless each and every one of you. Thank you.